The Great Wall of China is one of the most popular tourist attractions in the world, with more than 10 million people visiting it each year. So popular the Chinese government had to cap the number of tourists per day to avoid congestion. The entirety of the Great Wall spans over thousands of kilometers, if not tens of thousands of kilometers, depending on what you consider to be part of the wall. Most tourists visit only a very small section of the wall, close to where the museums and souvenir shops are. Very few venture far from these major tourist areas. The story I will present to you today is about a group of people who attempted to traverse a less visited part of the Great Wall, but got caught in a freak snowstorm, resulting in some of them never making it back alive. This is the story of the Great Wall of China disaster. In 2012, a Japanese tour company by the name of Amuse Travel was offering a tour package they called the Great Wall 100 km Trek. It was a 9-day tour, costing the equivalent of 3,000 US dollars, starting on October 28th with an end date of November 5th. If you've watched some of my other videos, the name Amuse Travel may ring a bell. They were the company responsible for the 2009 Tomurashi Mountain disaster, in which 8 people lost their lives freezing to death, despite it being the middle of summer. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested. As the name implies, the Great Wall 100 km trek was a tour that would traverse 100 km of the Great Wall, specifically a section that is built around the northern border of Beijing. Participants would have to hike 15 km, or roughly 10 miles every day other than the first and last day. Hiking 15 km for 7 consecutive days requires a reasonable level of fitness, especially considering this is across a less maintained part of the Great Wall, and there will be ups and downs along the way. Because Amuse Travel had been heavily criticized for allowing people with no mountaineering experience to participate in their 2009 Tomodashi Mountain tour that led to disaster, they decided to only allow people with mountaineering experience to participate in the Great Wall 100 km trek. However, they didn't set specific requirements on the level of experience, nor did they bother to do any kind of verification. If a guest claimed they had some experience, they would be allowed to join, no questions asked. There were four guests who signed up for this tour, one man and three women. They had varying degrees of experience. One guest had been mountaineering for decades, and had been to the summit of Kilimanjaro, the tallest peak in Africa. On the other hand, there was a guest who had picked up the hobby rather recently, hiking up a local mountain every once in a while. The guests ranged in age from their late 50s to the oldest being in their late 70s, which should have been concerning, as hiking 15 kilometers every day for a week would be taxing even for someone in their 20s. The four guests, along with their guide, departed Japan on October 28th. Upon arriving in Beijing, they were joined by a local guide, making the group a total of six people. They would spend the afternoon of that day touring the city and stay in a hotel for the night. The following day, October 29th, the group of six head into the mountains northeast of the city, where they would get on the Great Wall and begin their trek. They were to spend the next week traversing the wall from morning to midday, and spending the nights in small hotels or guest houses. Things initially went according to plan, but after the first few days the guests would begin to show signs of fatigue, and the group would arrive at their hotels later in the day than expected. On the night of November 2nd, the guide checks the weather forecast. The forecast indicates they would begin snowing from the afternoon of the next day. The guide didn't think much of this, as they should be at their hotel by afternoon, and snowfall in Beijing usually isn't very serious anyway. The next morning, November 3rd, it had already begun to rain, although slightly. The guide discloses to the members that snowfall is expected in the afternoon, and if anyone has concerns regarding the weather. The group unanimously agrees to proceed as planned. They had come this far. Why let some slight rain and snow get in the way? However, they may have been too confident, as the fatigue from several days of hiking, combined with the rain, would hinder their progress. The rain had made the stone path of the Great Wall slippery, 
demanding more physical and mental energy. On top of that, nature was not on their side this day. At around 1 p.m., it begins to snow, earlier and heavier than forecasted. Quickly realizing how serious the situation could get, the guide instructs everyone to pick up the pace, but the elderly guests are unable to do so. As the snow gets deeper by the minute, they reach a particularly steep section of the Great Wall. The snow was over a foot deep by this point, and the guests are unable to climb the slope. They hadn't been expecting snow on this tour, and no one had equipment such as microspikes or crampons. The guide decides to call for rescue, but cannot get a signal on this part of the wall. Usually guides would be carrying satellite phones on these type of tours, but that was not the case here. This was a section of the wall with very little traffic, so the possibility of someone finding them here was very low if they could not get in touch with the rescue services. Before long, the male guest collapses to his knees, shivering. The tour company had not expected sub-zero temperatures on this tour, and therefore the clothing they had instructed the guests to bring were inadequate for the conditions. This guest was also the oldest member of the group in his late 70s. Realizing they would all follow the same fate unless they got in contact with the rescue teams, the main guide instructs the local guide to run to the nearest settlement and call for help. The local guide somehow manages to claw his way over the slope, just as the sun was beginning to set. Throughout the night, the remaining five members of the group huddle together as the snow turns into a blizzard. It would later turn out this day had the most snowfall Beijing had seen in over 50 years. The eldest man had gone totally unresponsive, and the other guests were slipping in and out of consciousness. Meanwhile, the local guide had run through the darkness to the nearest town, where he managed to contact police and request rescue. But because of the snow, all of the roads were extremely congested. Beijing was not used to this level of snowfall, and cars did not have snow tires or chains. At one point, the rescue team had to get out of their vehicle and literally push it by hand, significantly increasing the time it took for them to arrive on scene. By the time the sun rose on November 4th, all of the four guests had become unresponsive. The main guide, deciding there is nothing he can do by staying there, scales the slope and makes his way to the nearby town. On his way there, he runs into the rescue team who had come to save them, and goes back with them to where the other members were. The four unconscious guests are carried into the city to receive medical attention. In the end, three are pronounced dead, and one woman, the youngest of the four, made a full recovery. It didn't take long for news to reach Japan, and immediately come under public scrutiny. Deaths on a guided tour is a serious problem to begin with, but the same company, Amuse Travel, had caused several deaths in another tour just a few years ago. Initially, the finger would be pointed at the main guide. The plan was too physically demanding to begin with. He should have considered the possibility of severe weather considering it was a nine-day trip. He should have been aware there was a particularly steep section of the wall, and so on. But it turns out this guide had very little experience, only half a year or so since joining Amuse Travel. Despite this, he had been tasked with everything from planning the tour, the logistics, and the actual guiding of the tour. Some people would feel sympathy for the main guide, being forced by Amuse Travel to go in way over his head. People would also point out how the protocol within Amuse Travel was flawed. They only required guides to phone in if something went wrong, and assume tours were proceeding as planned if there was no contact. Usually it is the other way around. Guides would report their progress a couple times a day at designated times, and if there was no contact, the company would assume something went wrong. It is speculated Amuse Travel did things their own way to cut costs by reducing the number of reports coming in from their various tours. On top of this, they didn't give their guides satellite phones, so they wouldn't be able to call in for help if they ran into trouble in a remote location. After all was said and done, Amuse Travel would be revoked of their license and were suspended from providing travel services in the future. What do you think of the case? Is it the guide who was at fault? 
Or should Amuse Travel have taken more precautions and assigned more experienced staff to the tour? Let me know in the comments below. Amuse Travel had another mountain climbing tour that led to disaster a few years prior to the Great Wall incident. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested. A big thank you to Korbachu and my other Patreons. Your support is greatly appreciated. And as always, thank you for watching until the end. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next episode. I'll see you next time.